Okay, yeah, we'll get started. Okay, so uh, do you have any questions about the first class? There were, there were a lot of uh, new concepts introduced in the first class. So uh, that's about artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. Uh, we need some time to get used to it. So in the following classes, we will repeat those uh, terms and we're gonna be more familiar with those concepts. So uh, today we're still gonna invite Kevin uh, to give us a lecture. Kevin, are you ready? Yeah, sure. Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, would you mind enabling screen sharing? I'm not able to screen share. Oh, yeah. All right, great. So, um, hey. hey everyone, welcome to today, today's class. Uh, the emphasis will be on neural networks today, but we'll start out with an overview, or, or basically a recap of what we had talked about last week with machine learning. So um, as we talked about, machine learning is about allowing computers to draw insights from data. Now, this is a very general statement, but as we saw last time, there are a lot of different subtasks and a lot of different ways that we can perform machine learning, um, chief among them being perhaps decision trees, linear models, um, clustering methods like k-means, et cetera. Those were um, introduced in the last lecture, and they are very effective ways of learning from data. We saw that they could predict the flower type from the sizes of its petals and, and other parts of the flower. Or um, we saw they could predict whether somebody's going to die based on their age and the number of malignant nodes that they have in their body or something like that. So lots of different applications in lots of different areas. Um, now, we also talked about the different types of machine learning. There are basically two major categories when you talk about machine learning. There are supervised problems where you have a data set that contains both X's and Y's. So contains both X's and Y's. And then the unsupervised is you just have a data set of X's and you're supposed to derive some insight from this data without actually knowing the labels. And so an example of unsupervised learning would be clustering because you don't know what the data is points are supposed to be, you're supposed to find the similarities and differences between them and cluster them into different groups. That would be an example of an unsupervised problem. So within the realm of supervised learning, because this is so important in ML, we further split this up into regression and classification. So regression, as we saw, is where you try to predict a continuous value, um, usually on the real plane or real number line. Um, and then you have classification, which is you want to put something into a bunch of bins. Like in the case with the flower, we had three bins. We had, you know, like a setosa, we had a versicolor, and we had a virginica. And so you try to put some new flower that you see into uh, one of these three bins. Sorry, that arrow is supposed to go over here. Um, so that's classification. Now, um, we also talked about some important pieces of vocabulary where this is the this is basically what defines the data that you get in. So of course we have the features which are the properties of the data that are used for prediction. So in the case of the flower, it, this would be the um, the sizes of the sepals and petals. Um, you have the label, which is what it's supposed to be. This would be one of the three flower types and then, when you combine features and labels, you get out an example. So a complete example has both a feature and a label. Now note that this only applies to supervised learning problems. If you're talking about unsupervised learning, then you actually won't have a label. So you'll only have features. Um, 
this is something that we didn't really talk about, which is the the set of words that are synonymous with with each of these, because people in machine learning like to call the same thing many different things based on what their background is. Like you might recognize some of these from statistics, or um, or maybe your science experiments when you talked about independent variables and uh, dependent variables, um, or things like that. So you should consider all of these to mean pretty much the same thing, right? If you think about what a target is, a target is a response that you get when you're shown a bunch of features, or it's the output that you get, or it's a label, or it's the variable that depends on some other variable. So that's the target. And then of course the feature is because these are the pieces of data that you use to make a prediction. They're often called predictors. They are the inputs that go into your model. They're the independent variables that, that influence the dependent variables, or they are the attributes of whatever entity you're trying to measure. For example, the sepal length, uh, width, petal length, petal width, those are the attributes of the flower. And then of course the example, when you combine a target and a feature, you get out an example where you have an observation, right? Because you might be in the wild, you might see a flower, it has its associated features, you know, you can measure its size. And you also know what type of flower it is just because you know, you're like a very intelligent botanist or whatever. And so this is what you would call an observation that you would get in the wild. Or of course, you know, it's also called a record instance data point and in row, because remember when we drew the big tables the other day, um, each row represents one example and each column represents a feature. And so that's why sometimes this is called a row. And then of course the label is the correct answer, the Y value, the category, these are all meaning the same thing. So hopefully when you read literature and you read tutorials online, teaching you how to build these models, you won't be confused anymore by the different words that people have for different for the same thing. Now this we saw was the, the general model for creating supervised learning models, where you have a bunch of data, which has X, Y's. Remember we're in a supervised environment. So you always have these X, Y's. And then you give it an untrained model. This model is initially really confused. It doesn't know anything. But then when you call fit, this is a process by which we tweak the model to make it a little bit smarter every time. And eventually you get a really smart model that understands something about the data and is able to take in data without the correct answer and predict the correct answers. So that's the entire thing with supervised learning. Now, there are some things that we omitted here, which is the process how you, you know, maybe how you select this data with answers, how you select this data without answers, and how you, um, how you figure out how good your model is. Because in this process, we're only training it and we're only predicting. We never did evaluations, which is a super important part of a model creation pipeline if you want to deploy this particularly in mission critical environments, like uh, trying to predict whether somebody is going to get breast cancer or not based on some physiological factors. So um, this is the general framework for supervised learning. Um, and it's quite similar with regression. I mean, this is more of like a general, general, general roadmap. But if you talk about regression, it's more or less the same thing. But instead of X and Y's being with Y being discrete, or, or, or I wouldn't say discrete because regression can Let's say that Y is instead of being categorical, it's no longer categorical, but instead it's continuous. Or in other words, it usually lies on the real number line. So um, movie data with revenue, you know, you give it a bunch of information about a movie and it'll predict something on the real number line. And you'll get it to fit a model that's really good. And then when you plug in a new piece of information about, you know, what exactly the movie is, it'll predict your revenue and this two will come out on the real number line. So that's regression, pretty much the same thing as supervised learning, nothing much different. Um, and then of course with classification, when you have X, Y, these are of course categories as the name would suggest. All right, so this is basically, um, just to really nail this home because this is super important and we'll be diving into this uh, more extensively in the coming few minutes. Um, this is a, a, more, a more concrete example, right? So you have a big data set, you've gone through and you've labeled which of these emails. So you got like email one, 
and you think it's spam. And then you have email two, you think it's not spam. And then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have N of these examples in a huge data set, like a big data set. And so you fit the model on this data set. So basically, and we'll talk about what this means in a second, but the general idea is um, it's sort of like teaching a student. If you were teaching a student how to do multiplication, you would maybe ask the student, hey, what's two times two? You would let the student answer. And maybe they answer eight, which is completely wrong. Uh, and basically you would tell the student, hey, no, that's not right. That correct answer is four. Please change the way that you think so that next time you output four. So then maybe after one iteration of this teaching, you ask it again, and maybe it says six, which is a little bit closer to four, the correct answer. And then, so this is iteration one. And then after iteration two, it might say two times two equals four. And this is the correct answer. So this is basically what FIT is doing. I'll talk more specifically about how this works, particularly in neural networks in a second. But again, we show all these emails to the model and we ask it to predict whether it's spam or not. And then we penalize the model for its wrong answers. We're like, hey, this email was actually spam and you said it wasn't, this is bad. So fix yourself to make sure that it works. Um, so after this FIT process, the model becomes very good at predicting whether an email is spam or not. And then you give it a bunch of unlabeled emails. For example, you might apply this on your own inbox. You go into your email inbox and you're like, okay, is this, is this email that I got spam? And if your model thinks that the prediction is yes, then you can throw out the email. This is the application of the model that you've trained using this big data set. So um, just to make this more concrete, this should help us understand how models are created. This is super, super important and we'll be coming back to this repeatedly over the next couple of days. Um, any questions so far? Okay, great. That's good because this was mostly intended to be a review. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to let me know. Just like unmute yourself, interrupt me, feel free to, or throw it in the chat, anything. So um, this I'm going to talk about, which is, I'm gonna be talking about training and testing splits right now, uh, because this is a super important part of building models, this pipeline that we talked about earlier. Um, you know, taking in a data set, fitting a model, and then trying to make predictions. Um, it's actually super important to make sure that your model is doing well. You know, when you fit a model, you can't just test it on the things that it was trained on because that's pretty much cheating. It's sort of like showing the students the test questions before they actually go into the test. So to prevent this, um, first consider that you have a huge, uh, let's say a huge data set, right? And this data set is a bunch of information and I'm assuming that this is the target column. This is the target. Like we're, so, we're trying to take in all of these other features and predict the domestic total gross uh, box office for each of these movies. And so, you, you know, you might, one intuitive way to approach this problem is how would you train this? You would basically take the entire data set and you would call fit on this entire data set. Um, but this is actually a pretty bad idea, right? Because once you call fit on the data set, um, well, here, does anyone wanna explain why this might be an issue if I call fit on this entire data set and this is all the data that I have? Okay, so Everett suggests that there are so many different factors. Um, so that's actually a good point. Um, this isn't quite exactly what I'm looking for, but this is a good point because we'll be talking in the future perhaps about feature selection. Um, you're totally right that there are a bunch of different factors here. Um, there are lots of them. This is a one, two, three, four, five, six. You've got six factors. Um, and we have to be careful with the factors that we choose, right? Because we don't want it to be we, want, we don't want to overflow our model with too much useless information that doesn't tell us anything about the predictor that we're trying, the, the variable that we're trying to predict. But I will say that a six is not many. Like you'll only start running into problems when you get into maybe the dozens or maybe hundreds. That would be quite bad. So um, the thing now is that 
Um, does anyone else want to suggest a uh, something like an idea or why it might be a bad idea if I just take all this data and I call fit? And the hint is that this ties into something I talked about earlier, where if you call fit on all of this data, the model will have seen it already. So how do you do evaluation? Okay, so I'll go ahead and answer my own question. This is an issue because if you call fit on this data, you will have no more data to do evaluation on. Because imagine that you take something that the model has already seen. Like you train the model to minimize error over, over um, let's say movie three here. And it already knows that the domestic total gross is supposed to be around this much money. Um, and this is bad because if you ask the model, given these features, what the domestic total gross is, it'll probably give you something pretty close to the correct answer because you literally showed it the answer beforehand. Um, and this is bad. So this is where the test split comes in. When you, you, when you have a, you know, a data set of labeled data and labeled data is very valuable, you need to split it into training and testing because you train the model on all of this data, you call fit on this. And then when you, when you go back to your test data, you delete the domestic total gross column you feed it all of the features, which is all of this other stuff on the left and the right. And it'll generate a bunch of predictions, right? It'll maybe think that the, the crudes, whatever the heck this is, will generate maybe two times 10 to the eight. I think this is eight zeros. Yeah, two times 10 to the eight dollars. It might think that the heat will generate three times 10 to the eight dollars or, or things like this. Um, and obviously this is pretty close. Two times 10 to the eight is pretty close to 1.8 times 10 to the eight. Now this one is pretty off. Uh, you basically doubled your prediction, et cetera, and et cetera. So by creating a test set, you are withholding some information from the model. You're showing it a bunch of these features that it's never seen before. This is very important. It can't have seen these before, but you showed all these different features and you make predictions. And now you can actually faithfully evaluate whether or not this model did a good job because it has done well or it has done poorly on new data that it hasn't seen before that it hasn't memorized. This is basically like the analogy to if you're taking a test, if somebody tells you what the test questions and answers are beforehand, then the test has no significance anymore. And we want to avoid that. So we make a training and testing split. Um, and as I talked about, uh, the purpose of the training data is of course to fit the model, but then your test data has to measure performance. So then you predict the label with the model and I will clarify that you want to put your features in here. Of course, you, you, you feed your features into the model and then you predict a label and then you compare with the actual value and then you measure the error. This is usually measured as accuracy um, if you're doing classification or you can do MSE, mean squared error for regression. These are different techniques to do it. All right, cool. So this is an example. If you have the training data, you fit your model based on this. This is linear regression, as we talked about yesterday, where you have two parameters, beta zero and beta one. Um, and so you have found that the beta zero and beta one that minimize this are precisely the beta zero that intersects the y-axis here and the beta one that defines the slope here. And you drew, you drew this line and you're like, this fits my training data pretty well. And then when you do it on your, and then when you, you know, on your other disjoint set of test data, you run the error calculations on this specific beta zero, beta one line, uh, you will find that there is a certain error associated with, um, with, with whatever regression line that you chose to draw. And this is going to be a good, a good, let's say yardstick for performance. This is basically the same assumption that teachers make when they give you tests. It's that they give you questions that are sort of similar in the same distribution of the, of the information that they taught you in the class, but you have not seen the specific questions before. 
so that when you do it, when you run the tests, it's going to be a good yardstick for performance and they can actually tell whether you learn the content or not. So any questions about this? Is it clear why we need testing and training data now? Okay, great. So let's continue. Um, you have training and testing data and you have this process of fitting all these models using the process of showing it a bunch of data, fitting it, and then making predictions, seeing how bad the predictions are and figuring out, okay, so this is generally how well my model will perform in the real world. Now it's time to get to the exciting stuff in neural networks. Many of you have probably heard of these kinds of things before because they're taking over the news. Everyone thinks they're gonna take over the world. It's kind of funny, um, but as we'll see today, these are quite simple structures that when expanded upon can yield very expressive and very powerful models. And we'll see how exactly this, this works um, in the coming slides. So just a little bit of an introduction to neural networks. It looks sort of like this. Um, it's, it's, not very, it's not a very detailed or um, informative drawing, but I think it looks quite cool. It's got a bunch of lines here that connect every node to every node, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, the whole idea behind neural nets is that you feed in a bunch of inputs and it's going to do some addition and multiplication as we'll talk about in a second. And it'll do this a bunch of different times. As you can see, there are lots of connections here. It'll go through all of these computations and then it'll spit out some kind of answer. And this answer is precisely the prediction. Um, so you can think of the neural net as a function. So the function will take in whatever input you have and it'll spit out an output. This is very simple. Your function, you know, for example, if you thought about linear regression, then your function, your function would be parameterized by beta zero, beta one, and your function would basically be beta zero plus beta one x, and this would equal y. Um, but this is quite a simple hypothesis, right? This is assuming that the underlying data can be modeled linearly, where every single data point can be can be can be transformed into an output simply by applying a slope and adding a bias. So this isn't always the case, right? There are a lot of perhaps pieces of data that might scale quadratically, which is completely not linear. It might scale you know, as one over X, or it might scale anything that's not a simple line. Um, so this is bad if you use a linear hypothesis. Now, the cool thing about neural nets is that they've been shown to be universal function approximators. Um, and so, if you create a neural net that's sufficiently wide and sufficiently deep, um, there's a theorem that states that you can model any function with this thing. So um, that makes them very powerful. They can model all different types of strange functions. Like you might even see a function like this that a neural network can model. Um, not quite a function here, but assume that it passes a vertical line test. Um, it can model all kinds of crazy functions and this is super, super important in the real world, because if you think about complicated problems, like looking at an image and telling whether somebody has breast cancer or not, this sure as heck isn't going to be a linear problem. It's not going to look like a line where, you know, maybe the darker a pixel is, the, the more likely this person is to have breast cancer. It's not going to be that simple. These functions are going to be very complicated, non-linear, uh, difficult to learn. And that's what makes neural networks so powerful. They can approximate all these kinds of different functions that aren't just linear. And therefore, um, they've seen lots of success in almost everything from self-driving cars to, to clinical and medical diagnoses, drug discovery, things like this. They are making inroads to every field imaginable. So let's consider how they work. The neural net is quite simple. It is simply a mishmash of all of these things these little circles, and these are what we call neurons. This is loosely inspired by the neurons in your brain. If you studied biology, you know that they take in an input signal as the signal is passed on through the internal structure of the neuron, and then the neuron sends other chemical signals out to other neurons, and that's how you think. So signal comes in, neuron does something, and then spits some other signal out to the other neurons, and this is how you're able to think. Um, so very interesting idea. This came up, you know, was probably thought of in the 1950s or something. People were like, hey, let's try to emulate the human brain because people are so smart. What if computers could be smart like this too? So it's basically just a bunch of neurons smashed together. 
But what is a neuron, right? This is an essential question that we haven't answered yet. So let's think about what a neuron is. So a neuron in a very, in very simple terms is <laughs> yet another function. And the function takes in a bunch of inputs. We'll say x1, x2, x3, dot, dot, dot. Let's say there are n inputs and it spits out an output. Now, what is this function doing? Um, this is an important question. So let's examine this. An activation function takes in a bunch of numbers. Now this number of numbers is very variable and I'll talk about what exactly this number is. You know, it could be three, like in this case, if you have three arrows coming in. It could be five, like I've drawn here, six, seven. It could be a million, it doesn't really matter. It takes in a bunch of numbers and on the tail end of all of these arrows are just numbers like X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, dot, 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 Xn. So we have N inputs that are all coming into this neuron. And in the activation function, or at least in the middle of this neuron, there's some form of computation that transforms the inputs. Uh, and we'll talk about what this is. And then finally, um, these inputs are all taken together and then they're spit out somewhere else. Now, just like from the general description of a neuron, you might think, how the heck is this going to learn something interesting, right? It's just something that takes in a bunch of numbers, probably adds, multiplies them together, and then spits out another number. Well, this is a good question. <laughs> and neural networks are notoriously difficult to develop intuition for. In fact, this is an active area of research right now, figuring out what exactly is going on in these neurons and why when you compose them and you put them together, they're so smart. But for now, let's just, just bear with me. We'll get through the math and then we'll start to see how they can sort of uh, compose with each other, stack on each other and learn interesting things. So um, here's how the math works. You have a bunch of inputs without loss of generality. We'll think about three inputs for now. Imagine that you, know, you could have x4, w4 or whatever and so on and so forth. Um, the first question that you might be asking is what exactly are these Ws? Uh, you know, not very, we, we, have, we haven't talked about them before. Um, so what these Ws are, are the weights. These are the weights to a model. And so these are the knobs, the parameters that you might twist and tune to, uh, to change in your model to, to improve performance. These are actually the parameters of the model that you're going to be training when you fit a model. So we'll talk about how this works in a second, but just bear with me now. So you have all of these three inputs and then you have this thing called a bias. A bias is simply a term that's added to everything. And as we'll see, there is a temporary input or a temporary value that is computed here, which is the summed multiplications between all the inputs and the weights plus the bias. Does this equation look familiar to anyone? Like, do you recognize this as something similar to what we just did very recently? And I'll give you a hint, just ignore the other values. Just look at the ones that aren't crossed out. What does this look like to you? Linear regression. Right, exactly. This is a linear, this is a linear function of, of, of x1. You have z, we could rewrite this as x1 beta 1 plus beta 0. And you can see that um, I have basically substituted W1 for beta 1 and then beta 0 for B. So in fact, this function here is simply a linear combination of all of the inputs. Very simple. Um, um, but you might remember earlier, I claimed to you that neural networks can learn all types of different functions, not just linear ones, even quadratics, maybe inverse functions, all of those kinds of things. So how do we introduce nonlinearities here? Well, it's quite, um, here, let's see. Okay, so we're here. I'm gonna skip all of this complicated stuff that we don't need to talk about. How do we introduce nonlinearities to this thing? Well, it's, um, it's quite simple. I think we'll talk about what exactly these uh, numbers mean in a second. But as you'll see, the, neuron takes in all of these things, takes a linear combination of them, which produces a Z, and it spits out an F of Z. So F of Z is called an activation function. And what an activation function is, is it takes this input and it does something to it. Now this is very vague, but that is by intent because you're, you take this function, right? You take Z and you apply a function to it and then you get your output. 
what is this function? It is usually a nonlinear function. Um, and so what we call a sigmoid here is an example of an activation function that a lot of people like to use. And it sort of looks like this. Um, on the x axis is your input and on the y axis is your output. Or equivalently, you might think of this as f of z. And you can think of this as for x equals z. And this is y equals f of z. So this is the value that's coming in. And this is the value that's coming out. And you have this cool looking S-shaped, the logistic curve. It looks like a logistic curve. Um, so this is called the sigmoid function. And as you can see, it's clearly nonlinear. If it was linear, we would see something. Ooh, the scales are all weird. You would get to one, you would get to one, which is about here. If it was linear, it would look sort of like this, um, I think. Yeah. Yeah, the scales are all strange. OK, but if it was linear, it would look like this. But clearly, it's not linear because it looks like an S shape. And it turns out that when you take a linear function and you apply a nonlinear function to it, this introduces what we call nonlinearities in the neural network so that in the future, instead of only being able to predict a bunch of lines on you know, your Cartesian plane, you can predict all types of crazy functions, like this kind of function, or maybe quadratic functions, or maybe inverse functions. All of these kinds of crazy functions can now be approximated using this neural network because we took the linear function and then we applied a nonlinear one to it. So all of this might sound very abstract and confusing, but the point of all of this is that this introduces a bunch of complexity to the neural network that makes it so powerful. Because um, it's not hard to show that if you basically take a bunch of these neurons and you put them together, and if you don't have any nonlinear functions, you're basically just repeatedly applying linear transformations, it is equivalent to one big linear transformation. So if we didn't have any of these nonlinear activation functions, your input your, your output would basically just be a linear combination of the input. And we're back to doing linear regression or logistic regression. Um, so this is bad because we use a neural network to be able to approximate more complicated functions. But if you don't use this nonlinearity, you will basically be wasting a lot of time doing all this math when it can be compressed into simply just beta zero plus beta i x i for all I, and this would be your output. Like this entire really complicated neural net could be simplified to all of this if we didn't have these nonlinear functions. As for like what exactly this means and why this is the case, you know, you will have to wait a couple of years until you take some math classes, maybe in high school and college. But um, just remember this, neural networks are very cool and they're very powerful because we have these nonlinear activation functions that make it able to process and model these very complicated nonlinear functions. Cool. Does anyone have any questions about this? We'll go through a specific concrete example in a second. I think it's cool. All right. So let's go through a specific example just to get you know our hands dirty with some math because it is uh, it's a little bit hard to think about in the abstract. So imagine that we have a bunch of values that are coming in, right? This could represent, let's say, we're trying to do something with students' grades, right? Like let's say we're building a neural network to figure out whether um, the class is doing well based on whatever the neural network thinks. So you know, you got a bunch of students, right? You know, your first student got a 90% on their test. Your second student got a 20% on their test. Your student got a 30% on their test. And these are the inputs to the neuron. And the way that we compute the output of the neuron, as we can see in this formula, is you multiply all the inputs by their weights, you sum them up and you add the bias. So does anyone want to tell me or walk me through how I would do this computation? Or like, what do you think the answer is as I do it? Well, this is sort of like a brainless math trick. So, I mean, math <laughs> um, exercise. Yeah. Okay. That's right. That's that's. I think that's. I think that's correct. Yes, it's two point six. 
cool. So you get this Z value out, uh, this, act, this, this neural network activates with a value of 2.6. Um, but remember, if we don't do anything to this, um, to this value, then it's equivalent to just taking a huge linear combination that reduces down to a linear regression problem. So this is bad. And now we want to apply an activation function. So we have a value of 2.6. Now looking at the graph of, uh, uh, of, of this uh, sigmoid function, does anyone want to tell me where you expect the value to come out to be once we apply it through the sigmoid function? Remember our Z was like 2.6. Any takers? This is not a trick question in case you were wondering. <laughs> And also just give us like an approximate value. It doesn't have to be exact. I don't know what it would be exactly. Anyone? Yeah, okay, this is great. So around 0.85, around 0.9, this is right because, well, this is just basic graph reading. If your Z looks like this and your F of Z looks like this, you plug it into the function, you go up and you're like, it's around here, which is, um, or I think Jason computed it. Maybe he computed it using a calculator and he says it's 0.93. So yeah, I would believe you. <laughs> um, so yeah, your, your activation should come out to around 0.9. Um, and let's see whether that's correct. Yep, it comes out to 0.93. You can compute this explicitly using the E, um, but we didn't do that because I don't have a calculator. So the neuron would output the value 0.93. So perfect. It seems like we're all having a pretty good grasp of how neurons work, um, at least on a computational level. So um, just a little bit of a recap to everything. So each of these neurons is doing the same thing. It takes in all of the inputs. There's only one input right here. So this would be X1. It's got a weight. So then you have a W1 and then you plus a bias. This would be the output of the neuron. So you get all of these neurons that are outputting things and then they pass them all on to the next neurons. And then so it just keeps on doing this, keeps on doing this, keeps on doing this. Now, one thing that I would like to clarify uh, in terms of the neural network architecture is, um, is, is, is just a concept check to make sure that you're following everything correctly. So each neuron gives its output value to every single neuron in the next layer. So um, like this. And then, so this one gives it to this one, this one, this one, this one. The second one gives it the first, second, third, fourth. And then the third one gives it to the first, second, third, fourth. How many weights are in this specific layer of the neural network? This is a little bit more involved. So feel free to take a few seconds to think about this. But the answer is not that hard. And don't forget the bias in your answer. But I think this is important to see that everyone's paying attention. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, I just wonder, what does weight mean? Is, is the weight normalized? Okay, so this is a good question. Um, I didn't really explain what weights are other than the fact that they're the knobs that you can tune in your model. We're going to talk about how these weights are tuned because these are the, these are the weights that define your model's behavior, right? Like you, you pass in a bunch of inputs. Let's say that we pass in, you know, as we were talking about the grades of the students, you know, someone got a 90% on the test, someone got an 80% on the test, someone got a 50% on the test. These are the inputs. And the way that the neural network behaves is, is uniquely determined by what these weights are. Because you know you have the X1 and you have a weight between the first and the first one, W11. You multiply that, there's a W12, W13, W14, et cetera. When you perform all these multiplications and you just write out the function, 
these weights are what we can change to modify the behavior of the function. Um, and we'll talk about how we find these weights in a second, because initially we're just going to randomly choose these weights. And if we randomly choose these weights, the model is going to be pretty dumb. Um, but there's a smart way that we can say, given these weights, how do we how do we make these weights a little bit better? And then we do this a bunch of times, maybe like a thousand times. And if we make it a little bit better every single time, the weights will eventually reach a place where if you pass in a bunch of values, it's going to give you a, a very good prediction. Um, and this is what we're going to be talking about next. But Winston has a proposal for 12. Benjamin has a proposal for 0.9. I would say that Winston is a little bit closer. I don't think that the number of weights is going to be a fraction or like a floating point value because, you know, we're only working with integers here. We're just counting how many weights there are. So Winston is actually very close to the correct answer. Um, and I think the correct answer would be 16. Because again, don't forget the biases. I think Winston just forgot that there's a bias on every one of these. But you know, the way that you would compute this is that you know there are three neurons here and you have four neurons here. So a general formula would be the number of neurons at some layer L times the number of neurons at some layer L plus one. And this would give you the number of weights. But then, um, you would add the number of neurons at L plus one. So if you factor the L plus one out, this would be an L plus one. And I realize this notation is kind of bad because it looks like there's a thing here. But anyways, you can see that if we apply this formula to this uh, uh, where, where N L equals three and N L plus one equals uh, four, then we have four times four is equal to 16. So. Um, in more deep learning lingo, this is what we call a densely connected layer, a dense. And it's dense because every single node in the first layer is connected to every single node in the second layer. And that's actually why we can compute the number of neurons in every single layer using this formula right here. Um, as opposed to sparse, sparse would mean that perhaps every single neuron is only connected to one other neuron. So if you had the same setup, but you had a sparse network, maybe it would look something like this. Um, and in this case, it's hard to sort of guesstimate the number of parameters. But when you have a dense layer where everything is connected to literally everything, then um, you, uh, you can calculate it very easily using this formula. And the reason is that every single neuron on the first layer is connected to every single neuron on the second layer. And all of these are weights that we will be training using um, an algorithm. So, just like using your intuition, these weights, it would be very, very difficult if we just used a naive brute force algorithm, right? Yesterday, we were talking about using a brute force algorithm for linear regression. So again, if we brought up the beta 0 plus beta 1x, you could basically run a grid search, grid search, which is the equivalent of brute force on these parameters. So you would loop through pretty much all of the numbers on the real number line that are reasonable values, like obviously not negative infinity to infinity, but maybe like negative 100 to 100 with a step size of 0.1 or something like that. Uh, and you could just try literally everything and see which one gives you the best test error. Well, this might work if you have, um, if you have two parameters because the number of values that you need to search is basically you know, imagine that every single value can take on n, then you're going to be needing n to the number of parameters. You need to try this many things. So this is exponential in the number of parameters. And so this is a very bad idea because let's say that, you know, you think that each of the weights can take on a hundred different values, then you would need to try a hundred to the to the number of parameters, different things. And in this case, our model has 16 plus 20 plus, um, should be 15, I think. Yeah, plus 15 parameters. And so this is a very, very big number if you consider 100 to the 16 plus 20 plus 15. So brute force is a very, very bad idea here. So we need a smart way to figure out what all of these weights are. and to help us with that is going to be this thing called gradient descent, which we will talk about right now. But before I get into gradient descent, I just want to bring up a couple of things that should be on your horizon 
of course, like this is way too complicated um, to, to talk about in detail, but it turns out that these weights can be represented very nicely using something that is what we call a matrix. You'll study this when you get into high school, but um, a matrix is basically a big stack of numbers and they have very nice properties. You can multiply them with each other. They represent linear transformations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's a very compact way of writing neural network operations. Because if you think about writing it the way that we did, you know, you have to sum over all of the inputs, X, I, W, I plus B. Uh, this is not great because you need to do this for every single neuron and you're gonna end up writing like a bunch of these equations. You might end up writing, you know, lots, lots of equations. And all of this can be represented very compactly using matrix notation. Like this is literally all you need to write, which is like XW. Um, but this is sort of out of the scope of the course. I just wanted to bring it up because, you know, it's a good thing to know that neural networks can be represented much more simply than writing a billion equations of this form. Um, but this is something that we'll, we'll talk about maybe when we have the requisite background. Cool. So, yes, a uh, neural network can be computed with linear algebra. So that's the operations on matrix. Right, exactly. So there are very nice um, ways that we can write neural networks and, you know, um, represent them concisely. But, you know, I think for the purposes of our course, because our neural networks are going to be fairly simple, at least the ones that we study explicitly like these, you know, it's reasonable to write out all of the equations for these. So we won't talk about that now, um, but it's just something to keep in mind. So yeah. Um, all right, cool. So just to recap you know, the past section, we talked about neural networks and how they are representative of how human brains work, where every neuron re receives some kind of input impulse, like a, a stimulus, like an input signal. It goes through the neuron, it does some processing, and then it spits out an output signal, an output impulse to all the future neurons. And it forms sort of this chain reaction where one neuron is going to, see one neuron is going to activate another neuron. And then this is gonna activate another neuron. And this is how we think uh, and, and think and reason and memorize and learn. Now, humans try to replicate this in neural networks by building these things called neurons. And neurons have a very simple uh, formulation, very simple mathematical formulation. They basically just take a bunch of stuff, just take a bunch of inputs. You, you take a linear combination of the inputs, which means that you take an input, you multiply it with a certain weight, you sum this over all of the inputs, and then you add a bias term, uh, which gives us a, a, um, a nice, nice output. And then you apply the output through an activation function that sort of squashes the value, makes it makes the function nonlinear so that you can learn super complicated functions. And then you stack a bunch of these neurons, these sort of neurons that we talked about, you stack a bunch of them together into uh, this big thing called a neural network. And these neural networks are super, super powerful. They've been beating humans at tasks like uh, diagnosing certain diseases, predicting you know, some people like to use these to mess with the stock market, although it doesn't work too well. Um, they've been beating people at medical diagnosis for a while now. They're starting to drive our cars for us. There are a lot of incredible applications that rely on neural networks. And we're going to discuss how neural networks can now learn, you know, how we can find these weights without doing brute force, which is really stupid. And then once we know this, in the future classes, we'll talk about how neural networks are applied to all of these world changing applications like uh, computer vision, NLP, in the medical domain, et cetera. So without further ado, we're gonna be talking about backpropagation in neural nets. So remember at the very beginning of the class, we spent a lot of time talking about the process of training a neural net. Like you give it a bunch of data, you know, you give it a model. This is a dumb model. And you take all of this and you put it through an algorithm called FIT. And so what exactly is this FIT algorithm? This is what we're gonna be talking about today. And it is called backpropagation, backpropagation. 
Um, you'll see this term everywhere you go if you learn about neural nets in your future. But the idea is that we can find these weights that make the error minimal using this cool algorithm. So how do we do this? Well, um, remember in the past, we introduced this idea of a cost function, right? A cost function is something where you take in two y's. One of them is the correct y. One of them is your predicted y. So let's just rewrite this as j y predicted. So pred and then j y true. So you take in the predicted value. This comes comes from neural network. This is like the output that you get and y true. And we want to quantify the difference between them. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that we can do this. One of them is to take the difference. So like, this is a very natural way of saying things where you basically take their difference, you square it and you're like, okay, you know, if the answer is supposed to be four and I predicted six, well, it's obviously not as good as if I predicted five, right? Well, this is the assumption that we make. Maybe this always isn't true, but you know, if you take four minus six squared, this gives you four. If you take four minus five squared, this gives you one. And um, clearly predicting six is worse than predicting five because the error is lower when you do five. So remember that, um, that, that, that we have this thing called an objective function or objective. It's also called a loss function. Um, these are all synonyms for each other that we want to minimize. This is the whole goal of training machine learning models is to define an objective for the model and ask it to be minimized and we'll do it with some algorithm. Now, how do we do this? Well, the slide outlines the general process by which this is carried out. So you basically put in the training inputs, you get the output, right? We talked about this. You need to get the prediction from the model. You know, to make this more explicit, we can write this as J F of X, Y true. Um, what this means is that you want to pass in whatever the neural network said was the correct, what, you know, what, whatever the neural network thought was the answer, you compare it to the correct answer and then you take their difference. So this is the same thing, but it makes it more explicit that we need, you need to put in the training inputs to the model to figure out how bad the model did. It's sort of like, again, going back to that example of teaching a kid multiplication, you ask it, what is two times two? And it's gotta give you the answer first. You have to know what it thinks about what two times two is before you can say whether it's right or wrong. So then, of course, we compare the output to the correct answer, which is looking at this loss function j, which is this thing that we talked about here. And then we adjust and repeat. Now, this step is very vague in this presentation, right? Because, you know, how exactly do you adjust based on this function? Like, obviously, I know that 4 is, is worse than 1, but how do I get 4 down to 1? Um, so this is the question that we'll be tackling through backpropagation. Now, remember earlier I mentioned that the way that we find these weights is to randomly initialize them and iteratively take steps that make the error a little bit smaller every time. And maybe you do this a thousand times or 10,000 times and you'll be able to find the correct answer. So backpropagation, just to give you a, um, a, a disclaimer, knowledge of how it works specifically requires a little bit of higher level math, but it's okay because I think the intuition is very accessible even to, I mean, even to someone who hasn't taken pre-cal or maybe algebra two, I think the intuition is still very accessible. So we're gonna talk about the intuition for how this works. And then I will reserve the discussion for how exactly it works for maybe when you've taken a calculus course. But let's dive into this. Um, this is the pseudocode for gradient descent. So first of all, you make your prediction. So Y predicted is equal to f of x, and f is your neural network. You calculate the loss. So you say j, y, pred, y, true. And then you calculate the gradient of the loss function with respect to the parameters. This is, this is the really key part. And it's perhaps a little bit confusing because some of these terms are probably not familiar to you. Um, so let's talk about what this means. We're going to take an aside to talk about what this means. So let's dive right into the aside. 
imagine you have a, a function that looks like this, right? Imagine that we only have one parameter. So our model is basically, let's say like y equals beta x. So we're trying to find a beta so that if I have a big data set of things, like beta x has to go through the origin. So we're basically trying to find the slope of a line that goes to the origin that best fits this data. And imagine I have this kind of data, right? And so just by eyeballing it, you might guess that the best line, sorry for the squiggliness, should go through the origin here. Um, the best line might look like this. So maybe this is like y equals 2x with a slope of 2 over 1. So we know that the beta is supposed to be 2, right? But how do you know this? Uh, you actually don't. So what we do is you take a loss function and you parameterize it by beta. You're like, I have a beta. And along this number line are all the possible values of beta. And I define a function that says, for every single value of beta, what is how bad is my model going to be, right? For example, when beta equals 2, we probably see a minimum. Maybe, let's say, what happens when you say y equals 0.5x? What does this look like? It looks like this, right? Uh, this is bad. Looks sort of like this. And this is very, very bad because your model is predicting all the points over here and you've, you've predicted all the points on the wrong line. You've got the inverted slope. So when y equals 0.5x, perhaps here, 0.5x, or actually rather, this is just, you know, this beta value is just 0.5. You get a much higher error than you would have at two. So basically, you just go around and you define this function and you realize that you have a function here. Now, when we talk about loss, we talk about minimizing loss, right? We want to make the loss as small as possible so that we know that our model is smart. That is the goal. We want to make it less dumb and in that process, it should become more smart. And how do we do this? Well, if you think about this, 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 this function here, like a hill or a valley and you're at that hill and there is this thing called gravity, which will pull things down to lower heights. Um, imagine that you stand at one of the points and you release a ball. So the ball carried by gravity will start falling down the hill. It might oscillate here for a while, but it'll converge to whatever minimum is at the hill, right? And in fact, this, this function here, this parabola looking thing is what we call a convex function and in, in all cases where your hill looks like a convex function, no matter where you start the ball, it'll fall into the minimum, right? Like if you think about putting the ball here, you know, it might fall down here, it might oscillate a little bit while it loses its energy, and it'll still come here. You might, you might think, well, what about here? Well, it's still going to oscillate, 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 arrive here. If you think about it here, you drop it, it's going to oscillate, oscillate, come here. The point is that this function, no matter where you go, if you keep letting gravity pull pull this thing down, it'll reach a minimum. And it turns out that there is this tool in calculus called a derivative that can tell us where gravity is trying to push our ball. So let me just redraw this because it's kind of getting messy. If we have a parabola here and we're trying to calculate at this point where gravity wants to pull the ball. So this is a function of beta, right? And this is beta. What we call a derivative here is what we call df d beta. And this value tells us not exactly where gravity is trying to push it. It actually tells you the opposite direction. So df d beta would be something like this. This is what df d beta would look like, df d beta. So don't worry about this symbol looking a little bit strange. All you have to know is that it tells you the opposite direction of where gravity would pull this ball. So this ball should be going that way. So then the natural thing is if it tells you the opposite direction where the ball is gonna get pulled, we'll just put a negative sign on it. So then you have another vector in this direction that says df d beta, but it's actually the negative of df d beta. And so this is very, very important because all you have to do is calculate the gradient or the derivative at each step. And it tells you where gravity wants to pull this ball. And from this, you can be like, okay, well, gravity wants to pull this ball in this way because gravity is going to minimize the error. So let's just go in the direction of df d beta. Let's just go in the direction of this arrow that points down. So 
as you can as you might be able to imagine you have this you have this landscape you're you're here over here if dfd beta tells you to go this way maybe you take a step and it goes this way dfd beta tells you to go this way well you take a step and you're here dfd beta tells you to go this way you take a step and you're at the minimum so this is the entire idea behind gradient descent and back propagation you have a bunch of weights that you're trying to train in this case we only have one weight it's just beta but imagine you know this could be in a hundred dimensional space you know there could be a hundred different betas and you're trying to find this big there's this big hill where you're trying to let a ball loose and see where it's going to go and you, at every step all you have to do is to compute the derivative this tells you where gravity would push the ball so then you just push your parameters in the direction where gravity is trying to push your parameters and eventually you do this enough times it'll settle into what we call a local minimum and you will have found generally a pretty good set of parameters for your model. Um, so let me try to establish some better intuition for this. This is the 1D case. What if you had a 2D case, right? Because, you know, if we have beta zero and beta one, and this is the loss with respect to beta zero and beta one, does anyone want to tell me what I've drawn here? This is a loss function for what type of problem? Does anyone want to, does anyone want to contribute an idea? So these things on the x-axis are the parameters, uh, beta zero and beta one. And we're basically saying we want to construct a hill so that we can let a ball loose and figure out where beta zero and beta one should land. So what problem have I constructed the lost landscape for here? I'll give you a hint. I've brought this up like a lot of times, so it should be fresh in your memory. Any thoughts, anyone? So, yeah, so Everett asked what the question was. In this case, we're constructing a loss landscape to minimize the error over a certain parameter beta. But this is only one, this is only one parameter. Like our model could pretty much only look like this, y equals beta x or something. Um, so if we want to extend this to neural networks, we're going to have to think about many, many different dimensions, but for now, we'll just think about two dimensions in two dimensions. I've constructed something that uses, you know, you can on the, on two axes, this is a 3d graph. You have beta zero and beta one, and you have a loss with respect to beta zero and beta one. What kind of problem could this model, if I wanted to do what is called gradient descent or Perhaps you can think of it like ball rolling down a hill. If I wanted to do this thing of ball rolling down the hill, what kind of problem could I do this on with two parameters that we've talked about a lot? So Serena suggests quadratic, interesting. Um, I think you're getting warmer. Uh, it, so it's like, but remember that, you know, which of the models that we talk about a lot has only two parameters in it? Yes, exactly. So Everett says regression. This is exactly correct because remember regression is parameterized by beta zero plus beta one X. And in this case, we can use gradient descent to find the optimal parameters of our gradient uh, of our regression problem. Because, you know, maybe there's a landscape that looks like this 
where the global minimum is down here. And if you started over here, you could calculate the derivative with respect to both B0 and beta one. It'll tell you that this is the way that gravity wants to pull the ball. And then here it would tell you that this is the way that gravity pulls the ball. And then eventually it converges to the uh, minimum. And here, the assumption is if we reach the minimum of the, uh, of the lot of the cost landscape, we can say confidently sort of that these two parameters are very good for our problem because when we use these parameters on the test set, they give you a good answer and um, the, the error is low. So to give you a much better drawing of this, we will look at a very nice computer generated graph. So imagine that we're doing this for linear regression. This is sort of what I wanted to lead on to, beta zero plus beta one X. Then imagine that you initialize your parameters randomly and they just land here. Essentially what happens is when you do gradient descent, you calculate where gravity is trying to pull you, then it's going to pull you in this direction, pull you in this direction, pull you in this direction. And eventually it'll pull you to this global minimum place where your error is super, super low. And you have found a solution to your problem. You've found weights to your problem that, um, that yield a very good answer. So in fact, Remember, we talked about earlier that a simple neural network with a linear activation function is simply equivalent to a big linear regression model. So the ideas that I talk about here are easily extendable to the way that neural networks are trained because you have you know, a bunch of parameters and you can take the gradient with respect to them. And that'll allow you to figure out which way to push all of your parameters to uh, minimize the error. And in fact, this is exactly how neural networks are trained. Now, backpropagation is a little bit different from creating descent in the manner that you have to backpropagate through multiple layers. The reason why this is a little bit more complicated, you will learn about when you study calculus, but all you have to know is that backpropagation takes whatever error you had at the outputs and it propagates it through the layers to update the weights of every single layer. So it'll go through all of the weights over here and it'll be like, gravity is trying to pull you in this way. So please move in that direction. And then it'll go through this layer and be like, gravity is trying to pull you in that direction. Please go that way. And then it'll eventually get to the very beginning. And this, cons this constitutes one, what we call back word pass. So it'll basically find a solution to all these weights. It'll be like, this is a good, this is a good number for this weight. This is a good number for that weight. And when you run this a bunch of different times, then you'll get a neural network that's super smart that when you feed in a bunch of numbers here, it'll pass it through all the weights that you found and then it'll give you the correct answers more often than not. So that's the idea behind that propagation. Now, specifically how this works, we won't cover today, but um, I think that this intuition is pretty good, especially for not requiring any calculus background. So um, just to recap, we make the prediction, we calculate the loss, and then step three is the critical one here. I don't like the way that they phrase it because we don't have the requisite knowledge yet. So instead, what we should probably say is that you find where gravity is trying to push you because we want to go down and then go in that direction. Cool. Does anyone have any questions about this? Uh, thumbs up if you're good or thumbs down if you're confused and let me know what makes you confused if that's the case. Okay, great. It looks like most people are following, which is wonderful. Um, I will give people one more second to leave questions if they have any. Cool. Well, um, wonderful. So that's neural networks. Um, they might seem very, very complicated because they can solve so many different cool problems 
And especially, you know, when you draw them, they look very fancy and cool. But now you understand what exactly is going on. And it's actually a very simple set of instructions. At every neuron, remember, you multiply every input by a certain weight, you sum them all up, you add a bias, and then you spit this output out to everything in the next layer. And then you just keep doing this again and again, again and again, and you get an output. But initially these weights, they're randomly initialized. So this model could be really stupid. It really doesn't know anything about the data. So what it needs to do is to apply what we call gradient descent and propagate the errors back in the model so that it can find the correct weights. So this is an algorithm that is much, much better than brute force. It's in fact very fast because, um, well, it simply is just a very fast algorithm to compute approximately good weights. And um, yeah, this is how we're able to solve these really complicated problems um, using these neural networks. Now, of course, there aren't, you know, these neural networks aren't perfect. They're very difficult to interpret because in fact, what is a neural network? It's just a big bag of numbers, right? <laughs> you simply just have values for every single one of these weights. You know, maybe this is, uh, Maybe this is like 2, 10, 15, 20, 45, 14, or whatever it is. Like you just have a big bag of numbers. This is literally what a neural network is, just a big bag of numbers. And it's very hard to interpret what's happening because it's hard to just look at numbers and be like, ah, this is what the neural network is thinking. And so this becomes increasingly bad when your neural networks are involved in mission critical situations, like when you might have heard maybe about two years ago, there was an Uber self-driving car that crashed into someone and killed them. Who's responsible? And why did the neural network think that way? Or if you start building artificial intelligence machines that start sentencing people to, you know, that start to decide the duration of a sentence of a criminal and you find bias in it, you find things that aren't quite right. You know, people of different races getting different sentences for the same crime you can't really go into this model and be like, ha, huh, this is the, exactly the weight that's responsible for the bias because these numbers, they're just so difficult to interpret. The bias might be distributed among almost all of the weights of the model and this becomes problematic. So it's, it's, it's been a hot topic of research to understand what's happening in these neural networks, just like it's been a hot topic, topic of research to understand what's happening in our own brains um, to make sure that they work in, in important mission critical scenarios. Um, and of course, you can think of other examples of this, like if a robot makes a very, very disastrous mistake in a surgery, why did it do it and how can we fix it? Oftentimes it's, uh, it's unclear. So just keep that in mind. Neural networks are super, super powerful, but they're nowhere near the capability of taking over the world. And there also are interesting problems uh, that people are researching about them. So with that said, let's dive into the lab. The lab today is going to be pretty interesting. I think it's not going to be it's not going to be very standard. Um, what I'm going to do is show you guys a set of like um, show you guys some Python code that I wrote that implements a neural network, and we'll sort of play around with a neural network to get it to perform well. And once we play around with this neural network and we figure out that it performs well, we will deploy it. And then we can use MIT App Inventor to harness the power of this neural network. So remember yesterday I said that we'd be looking at Python code maybe on the last day of class, but uh, that day has come and it is the second day of class. You won't have to understand what's going on. I'll explain everything that's happening to you all, um, but this will be a, a nice sort of gentle introduction to how, how machine learning engineers design models and, and all of the different things that go into this. So. Um, before we get started, there's one thing that I would like to mention, and that is hyperparameters. Can someone remind me what a hyperparameter is? Feel free to unmute uh, and explain. Or maybe even just type in the chat, what is a hyperparameter? Or like, if you remember what a hyperparameter is, leave a thumbs up in, uh, in the reactions. All right, so looks like we don't quite remember. So, okay. Um, 
Cool. So let's just like, I'll give you guys a brief reminder of what a hyperparameter is, and then I'll ask you guys a specific question about neural networks. So a hyperparameter is something that the machine learning practitioner can change about a model. So remember that um, if you think back to k nearest neighbors yesterday, where basically you looked at the k most similar objects to you and you based your classification on that, k was your hyperparameter because the machine learning person has to choose this uh, based on just eyeballing it or a guesstimate or a, just maybe like a hypothesis for what's good. And that's gonna define how the model will work. So that's a hyperparameter. It's not explicitly learned by the model. So in the case of neural networks, we have that all of these weights are the parameters. They're not hyperparameters, they're parameters because the learning algorithm finds them. Your learning algorithm will find what these optimal weights are. Can anyone think of any hyperparameters in a neural network? What are the hyperparameters in this case? Number of iterations, training iterations. Yeah, sure. So that's definitely one. And this is pertains more so to the learning algorithm. Um, and that's definitely correct. Can anyone think of any that pertain specifically to what the neural network looks like? A step interval to adjust the parameters. Right, so these are all pertaining to the learning algorithm, but the neural network doesn't always look the same, right? You know, we, we could have a neural network that looks like this, maybe. We could have a neural network that looks like this where there are, you know, a million hidden node. So what is a hyperparameter that uh, defines what a neural network would look like? Can I even think? Number of hidden layers. So Kevin suggests in the chat, x1, x2, x3. Um, so actually, Kevin, do you want to explain, you know, what might make you think, think that this is the case? Like, so um, like because are... they're like the inputs, like the machine doesn't find them. Like, ah, yeah. okay. And they're... I like the way you think. Okay, so you're definitely right. The machine doesn't find them. Um, and maybe I should have been more clear with my definition of a hyperparameter. So for sure, like the machine doesn't find the um, inputs. And you're certainly right because the number of inputs will change the way that this neural network looks, right? Like you have three inputs here. If you had 10 inputs, then you would have 10 of these neurons at the very beginning. So this is definitely right. And this ties in very closely to what I was looking for, which is the number of hidden nodes in the neural network. Because who says that we're supposed to have exactly eight of these orange things in the middle structured in this way, right? Like it's very possible that you could, you could, you could, you could have maybe 10, 10 hidden layers here. Um, 10 hidden layers in your neural network in the first hidden layer. And then maybe in your second one, you could only have maybe two. So this would be another neural network. Maybe you would have whatever this is, I think this is seven. You could have three here and then you could have one. So this is also a valid neural network. Um, you can also have different numbers of layers. Like you don't have to have just this. You could add another layer here that has five. So in fact, the way that you define the model architecture strongly influences the way that your model will perform. Because intuitively, what do you guys think would happen if I added a bunch of neurons? Could we approximate more complicated or less complicated functions? Which of, which of the ones would you expect? if we have a bunch of neurons, like, yeah, exactly. We would be able to predict more complicated functions, right? And the problem with this is something called overfitting, which I won't talk about today, but I'll talk about in the future. You can think of it like having the wrong hypothesis for the problem. So let's say that, let's say that, you know, you're trying to predict, um, you're trying to predict, let's say your grades based on the number of hours that you study. How many of you think that this is a linear relationship? Like the more hours that you study scales proportionally with your grades or the, your grades scale proportionally with the number of hours that you study. 
I personally think that there is a lot of diminishing returns here. Like you can study, maybe you'll, you'll learn a lot through the first few hours of studying. So let's say that your grades versus the hours, this is grades. I think you know over the first couple of hours you'll your grades will improve a lot, but then it'll sort of bottom out as you know the more hours that you study, you won't learn as much as the first few hours that you studied. So if you wanted to model this function using a neural network, um, and if and if you only had sort of like a one layer thing, it's possible that your neural network could not approximate this. Uh, it, ju it just won't be able to because your model your hypothesis is too simple. Um, and on the other hand. If you make a neural network that's too complicated, you won't predict this. You'll actually predict a super noisy function that looks like this, perhaps. It'll start overfitting to all of your data points. Now, you're not responsible for knowing what overfitting is currently. I'll sort of talk about it in a future lecture. But if you make your hypothesis too complicated, it'll start trying to fit exactly the training data that you see, which sometimes could contain a little bit of noise. And this is very bad because then if you, show, um, if you show your neural network a new value, it won't predict generally the correct one. And I think a very good example of this is if you look at um, these two plots here. So at the very beginning, we were talking about linear regression. So we were constrained to drawing a line through this data. But if you had a super, super big neural network, you know, a huge neural network that has a million hidden nodes in it, you could probably learn a function that looks a little bit like this, that tries to hit every single data point in whatever it's trying to do. Now, this is not exactly a function, but you can imagine what I'm trying to say. Like your function will try to hit every single data point and it'll do very strange things to, uh, to try to hit them. But unfortunately, this doesn't really represent real life, right? Because some of this data might have been predicted, uh, collected with some noise. And if you Plug it, plug in like a value over here. You might expect it to be around here, but based on this function, it might end up up here. So your model will do what we call overfitting and it won't be able to faithfully represent whatever you're trying to learn. So the way that you design your neural network is super important. And we'll be seeing this once we dive into the lab uh, because I'll be able to change the number of layers in a neural network and we'll be able to see how this affects the performance of the neural network. So hopefully this made sense. Uh, let's dive into the lab right now. Cool. So this is some of the code that we're gonna be using to run our, our lab. Uh, don't worry if none of this makes sense to you, I will point out all of the important parts of the code. But first of all, let me zoom in and let's, uh, let's talk through it. So I've downloaded a data set from the internet, and this is a data set called Habermans, Habermans, let's just call them H's survival data. And so this is a data set that contains cases from a study that was conducted um, at this place on the survival of patients who had undergone surgery for breast cancer. So basically, we are trying to feed in a bunch of features about a person and their breast cancer procedure, and we're trying to figure out whether they survived or died. This might be very important in a clinical situation where you're trying to determine whether somebody is very high risk for death after breast cancer operation. So if you had a new patient come in, you know they have these attributes and you put it into this model and the model says, hey, this person is pretty likely to die if you do the breast cancer surgery on them, then you might think, yeah, let's not do it, right? So this is something with very significant real world um, um, importance. And so let's look at what the data set is. So this data set, I intentionally picked one that's very simple so that we can actually look through all of the data points. Um, but in reality, I think we need more than four features uh, to, to, to really determine this. But, you know, alas, we only have four in this data set. So let's look. Age of a patient at the time of the operation. So this is one of the features that we're going to be feeding in. We have a patient's year of operation. So Apparently it matters when a patient was operated on. And I think this makes sense because, um, you know, in more modern times you will have better equipment and perhaps your chances of survival are a bit higher. Um, number three, number of positive axillary nodes detected. I have no clue what this means, but I'm going to assume that this correlates with the number of cancer cells that they have in their body. So probably the more the worse. And then number four is actually 
the label, this is the target column, and this is the class attribute, basically, whether they survived or not. So this is what the data looks like. And notice how when I read the data set, I went through all of the features and I asked myself whether this makes sense or not, whether it makes sense including this feature in when I make my decision on whether somebody is going to survive or die. Because you don't wanna be cluttering your input with, with data um, that on average, if you split it, it'll give you a 50-50 split and you won't gain any information from it. So gotta go through and make sure that each of these features is reasonable. Like, of course, age matters because probably the older you are, the more likely you, like you are to suffer from some bad thing during the operation and die. So this is our data. And if we go into the data explorer and we look in the data, um, it's got a bunch of examples. So here you can see like, the first column remembers age of patient. Here we can actually split it this way. We have the, let's see, the age of the patient is the first column. So you know what, we can just do this age. Um, the operation, so this is the year, op year. Um, let's just say this is cancer cells, cancer nodes and result. So this is our file of information. And as you can see, every row is an example where we have some dude was 30 years old or some person was 30 years old. Their operation was done in 1964. They only had one cancer node and so they survived. Uh, but then you can see um, this person who was 34, six, the surgery was done in 1966 and uh, they had nine cancer nodes and they unfortunately died. So apparently there's, uh, there's just a lot of data here um, based on, you know, who died, who didn't. And we're gonna to try to learn a model to predict whether somebody is going to die or not from these first three features. All right, so let's take a look at how this happens. So in Python, uh, I guess we're just gonna give a brief introduction to Python now. There are these very cool libraries called TensorFlow and PyTorch. Uh, whoops, TensorFlow, PyTorch. These are uh, both very popular machine learning libraries in Python. And basically, you don't have to code any of this weird stuff with all the math and all of the um, neurons. All you have to do is call some functions. These are exactly like the functions that you see in MIT App Inventor. You just call the functions and it'll build the neural net for you and it'll perform backpropagation and gradient descent for you. So very popular frameworks and it makes life super, super easy. Basically what I do is I load in all of the data and I create a neural network. And this is pretty much the only part that we're gonna be looking at today. So you have a neural network and we're going to be defining the neural network based on a couple of things. So um, let me just delete this and we'll work on this together. First of all, we need to define the structure of our neural network. So let's go ahead and do that. Does anyone want to tell me what they think should be the size of the first layer based on the information that we got. So this is our neural network. It doesn't have to be exactly this size, but the first layer is definitely fixed. It, the, the size is fixed. Does anyone want to tell me what the size should be uh, using our data set here? Three. Right, exactly. Um, and does anyone else want to give an explanation for why? Because there are three inputs. Yeah, exactly, right? This is your input layer, so you're gonna need three inputs. All right, cool. Now, this is the part where you start to, you know, you're gonna be able to get creative with things. Does anyone wanna suggest a number of hidden layers in the next layer? It doesn't matter, you can just choose some number. Um, and then we'll see what happens. So does anyone want to volunteer some random number if they want? Five, okay, Benjamin suggests five. So we're gonna put five layers there. Um, great, okay, Jason says six. Okay, then I'll do one layer with five and then another layer with six. So in, in terms of Python, the, the syntax for this, you don't have to worry too much about, but since we said we wanted five in the next layer, we have a dense layer of five here. And then we just specify that the input shape is three because we said that there were three inputs. And uh, let's say that the activation, and this is yet another hyperparameter. Remember that we can choose 
sigmoid, which is the one that we talked about in class. We can also choose this thing called ReLU. It doesn't really matter which one you choose, but since we are already familiar with sigmoid, let's just choose the sigmoid one. Okay, so then we said that we have some input of size five. Great. Let's uh, let's do another one. Let's take George, uh, sorry, uh, Jason's suggestion, and let's make uh, a neural hidden layer of size six, and let's give the activation again to be sigmoid. And then finally, um, how many nodes do you think are should be at the last layer if we're trying to predict two classes? Feel free to One. unmute or chat. Either one or two, maybe two. Okay, so I hear one or two. Does uh, do any of the students want to like volunteer? Which one do they think should should be should be the one? I'd say two. Okay, um, so in fact, uh, either one is okay, um, and we can actually show that these are roughly equivalent to each other. Um, but yeah, let's just roll with two because it's a little bit more intuitive because we have two classes, and this way we can get out a probability of it being in either class. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. Let's, uh, let's put a dense layer here with size two and then we'll do the activation is equal to softmax. Now, what exactly is a softmax activation? I won't get into it specifically, but basically it takes in any set of values and it normalizes them. Because remember, when we talk about probabilities, um, if you have the probability of a certain set of events, they all have to add up to one, right? You can't say there's a 60% chance that I'll get, that I'll fail this class and a 50% chance that I won't fail the class because that adds up to 1.1 and that doesn't make sense. Basically what softmax does is it, it takes the final activations from your neural network. So in this case, we wouldn't have the third one. We would just have the first two. It takes those activations and it normalizes them so that they add up to one. That's pretty much all it does. So this is our neural network. And then we're going to compile it. We're going to give it a loss function. This loss function um, is something that we haven't talked about yet, but you shouldn't worry about it too much. It's called categorical cross entropy, but it's basically a way of saying how, how bad is your model? And that's what it says. And it gives you a value that you want to minimize. And then for metrics, we're, we're going to be wanting to look at the categorical accuracy. So how accurate is our model doing when, um, when 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 we do the training so let's go ahead and train this model i'm going to disable the flask thing for now i'll talk about what this is in a second but let's go ahead and train it so we're going to call it python 3 oh wait let's call it api so we're going to have an api file and we're going to call it train so let's see what happens moment of truth uh oh <laughs> there's a bug so it says that there's an attribute layer oh and it looks like i had a typo here it should be layers not should be layers, not layer. So let's try this again. All right. Okay. So it's off to the races. It's uh, doing a bunch of stuff. And here you can see all of the outputs that it spits out, right? So we have the loss value. It's about 0.5. This doesn't really mean anything on its own. You should just look at it in context of the other losses. You can see that the loss started out at 0.75 and now it's down to 0.5, which is a good thing. Um, and then there's an interesting thing here and I want maybe one of the students to maybe explain what's happening here. Why do we have two different sets of values? We have a loss here and a different loss that seems to be slightly different. And then we have one accuracy value and another accuracy value that are slightly different. So does anyone wanna volunteer any ideas for why this is the case? So I'll give you all a hint. Um, this is related to the test and train split that we talked about earlier. So what have I done here? 
Well, basically that gives it away, but like, okay. Well, so the correct answer here is that I have two sets of data that I'm trying to evaluate on. I'm trying to evaluate on the training set and the testing set. And speaking in terms of the analogy from earlier, you need to be able to look at both values to really reliably determine the, the performance of a model. Because it's not just enough that your student can memorize what they've learned from before, they also have to do what we call generalization, which is that if we show it different questions that are sort of similar, but not quite exactly the same from before, then it has to be able to, um, to, to, to still learn, uh, to still pr produce the right answer. So in this case, we can see that its performance on the things that it's already seen before is quite similar to its performance on things that it hasn't seen before. In fact, the things that it hasn't seen before, it actually does better on, which is just an element of chance based on how we split up the model. Um, but yeah, so this is a good thing. Um, now let's play with some, some neural network architectures that aren't quite as good. So, you know, maybe you might ask what happens if we make the neural network architecture super simple. Um, in this case, we just have three inputs going to two outputs. If you wanted to draw what this looks like, I can draw it out for you. Just bear with me. Um, basically, it would look like it would look like uh, three inputs and then two outputs, and then you would have these connections. So a super simple neural network, um, and we might think that it might do worse. So let's see if it actually does worse. Let's train it again. Ah, so as you can see, if we have a super simple neural network, it's simply just taking linear combinations of everything. Of course, there's a softmax activation at the end, but even though it does pretty okay on the uh, training set, it's really memorized everything. It doesn't do so well on the things that it hasn't seen before. So this is what you would see as like a case of the student being able to memorize all the facts that you tell it, but it's not able to synthesize anything. It's not able to return the correct answer when you ask like a similar question, but not quite exactly the same. So as you can see, these hyperparameters that we're choosing greatly, greatly impact the performance of the model. I could keep on adding layers like this. We can make this layer, this neural network super, super deep. Like this is a, it's close to 10 layer neural network, I guess. And let's see how it does here. So in this case, you can see that the performance is very similar to what we saw before. Like we saw that, you know, the, the, the holdout set had an accuracy of 0.7. This one had an accuracy of 0.73. So as you can see, we, we do have diminishing returns here. Like this neural network is significantly more complicated than the one that we had before, but it doesn't perform much better. In fact, I don't think it performs better at all. So it seems like we have a sweet spot here with like five, six, two, and it produces a model that's pretty good. So that's cool. Um, hopefully this gives you a little bit of insight into how these models are built. You know, as a machine learning person, you have to go in and mess with this models, you, you know, you can figure out what is a good um, model architecture to use, you know, how many hidden layers do you want? How many um, things do you want? How many neurons in each layer do you want? And etc. So that's the neural net, all done and dusted. So um, yeah, the final part of this lab is going to be on my part, which is I'm going to deploy this onto a website. And um, you'll be able to call it from anywhere in the world. Does anyone, so just remind me, in the crash course or in your previous experiences with MIT Alphabet, have you worked with APIs before? Like web APIs, JSON APIs. Cool. So Everett's giving us a thumbs up. Kevin, uh, Kevin says yes. Kenshin says yes. So it seems like some of us have, so like, has anyone not done this before? Okay, so we have some students who haven't done this before, but that's okay. Um, then I can show you guys how exactly this works and then we can, uh, we can go from there. So go ahead and fire up MIT App Inventor very quickly. And um, while, I, while I load up something, so go ahead and fire up MIT App Inventor and then throw an okay in the chat when you're, uh, when you're, when you're done with that. I will need to start 
everything up. Okay, great. So everyone's on MIT App Inventor and I've got everything up and running. I'm going to paste something in the chat. This is the API endpoint. Um, should be in the Zoom chat. It shouldn't, like if you click on it right now, it should probably give you an error, like not found or something. Uh, don't worry too much about this. Um, and I'll sort of explain what we're doing here. So let me go ahead and jump into MIT App Inventor and we can get started on the lab. So basically what I'll be doing for the lab today is showing you all how to use APIs. And then once you use the API, your assignment will just to be, today's homework will be much, much easier than yesterday's. Yesterday you had to implement this Markov transition matrix and build it up by yourself. Today's project will just be to implement using the API to call a machine learning model. And uh, this is actually quite practical because usually you won't be the one building the machine learning models. You'll be stealing it from someone else. And this way you can, you can use the work that other people have done for your own purposes. Um, and that's will be fun. So this one is lesson two API, API example. So JSON APIs are pretty simple. Basically you send a request. It's basically like a website, except you're asking for information and you're not asking for like these cool graphics. You're asking for information. Um, to do this in MIT App Inventor, you need to go down to connectivity and drag in a web component. Um, and so it'll, it'll put it down here as a non-visible component. And then to use it, you'll need to go into blocks and go to web and a couple of things. So the first thing is that you'll need to uh, set a URL. Well, I forgot to drag in a button to do things with. So then just drag in a button and say, button uh, go or something like that and then click me to get info and then also add in a label just like this is for testing purposes results will be shown here and let's say that this is the label result all right so you got these you got this button you got this thing and you want to go to the button and be like when button is clicked, we want to set the URL. And so then go ahead and copy the link that I set in, in, in the Zoom chat to, um, to uh, into here, which is going to look like this. And then the next thing that you want to do is you're going to want to post or actually just call it get. Get is the right term here. Basically, what you're saying is when you go to this URL and you call get, you're asking for information. You're asking it for whatever it's got to offer. This is an API endpoint that's linked up to this uh, Python script that's running our neural network. Um, you're basically asking for information. You're like, hey, I want to know whether my dude is going to die based on these parameters. Please tell me. Um, so then you're going to call web1.get. And then there's going to be a got text block, which is going to be when the web sends this information back to you, you're gonna get some content. And let's just say that for now, just for debugging purposes, we'll just set the label result text to the response content. All right, now there's one final detail. You might notice that, you know, how exactly are we supposed to show this API, what our features are so that it can make its prediction? Well, there's very specific lingo for this. It's basically like a, a web page address. You have to go to, ngrok.io slash API slash NN predict. This is the endpoint that I defined. And then to pass in this information, you're going to need to type in a question mark. A question mark basically means here, I'm starting to give you some information and you're going to say data equals, and then you're going to type in your features. Remember that we had three features. So we're going to be typing in three comma separated values. Let's say that we have somebody who's like, I don't know, like 88 years old, they did their surgery in 1936 and they had a hundred cancer nodes or something like that. So this, this, like this, this thing 
um, if you actually put it in your browser, you should get a result. And this result gives you two values. It gives you zero, which is either zero or one, whether they lived or they didn't. And then this is a probability of that decision. So you have a 64% chance of zero. I don't remember what zero was. Let's see what it is. Zero means that they survived five years or longer. So I'm actually kind of confused as to whether they were supposed to survive or not. Um, in my opinion, this person shouldn't have survived, but apparently our neural network thinks that they have. Um, we can actually try some different values. Um, if they had zero cancer nodes, or maybe they had maybe three, or maybe 88 is too big. So maybe 34, they had like 20 cancer nodes. It all seems to be giving us around the same value, um, which is quite interesting. And none of them seem to be in the one class. So we'll talk about this a little bit later and I will share maybe an idea as to why this is happening, but the API should be working for you now. And basically, if you just use this on your, um, if you just click go on your, on your little phone here, you should be able to see the results and it'll give you that probability like, hey, there is a, um, there's an X percent chance that this person is either going to die or not die. So we have reached a problem, right? Our application, you know, even though it's returning some stuff, it doesn't seem to be very reasonable in how it's doing things. So this is actually a very important and interesting thing that we're going to need to do. We're going to need to debug this model, but debugging a machine learning model, as we talked about, is very difficult. It's sort of confusing because you have all these different weights. You don't know what they're doing. Um, so yeah, so here I'll be sharing a couple of tips and tricks to, uh, to do this. Um, but before I do that, uh, can I just make sure that everyone has it working? I'm seeing a lot of API requests come in, so I'm going to assume that there are lots of people who are getting this working. Um, but just let me know if you need more time or you're confused and if it's not working. So it seems like it's working for most people, which is great. Um, so now let's dive into some debugging tactics. This is something that's very realistic. This will happen a lot to you and you'll need to figure out why. So I think one of the first things that you should try when you reach a problem like this is to feed in one of the examples from, um, from the data set and see whether it remembered it correctly. So if we go over here and we're like 38, 69, 21, and we plug this into our data here, we would expect it to be one, but unfortunately it says zero with 63% probability. This should set off alarm bells in your brain because clearly the model did not even learn this properly and it was already in the training set. It's sort of like you're trying to get a model to remember something, to memorize it, just, just like rote memorization and it's still failing. This is not good. So now you might be asking, well, I thought that our, um, our metrics were pretty good. Like we had sparse categorical accuracy to uh, 73%, which is quite nice. Um, so this is an issue. What you, might, what you might not know yet is that this data set is actually quite unbalanced. So this data set is consisting of 306 examples. I think this is um, what it says, 306 examples. But if you look at the data itself, you'll notice that a lot of these are actually of the class survived. So you can see two of the die here, but all of these are, are all survivals. All of these are all survivals except for these two, these, these couple. And so there is going to be a problem here where your data set is unbalanced. So the model can actually hack everything by saying that, eh, I'll just predict everything that's, uh, you know, assume that 70% of the data points here are actually in the survive class then the model could actually attain 70% accuracy just by predicting survive all the time. So this is not good. And we need some way to fix this. So the first thing that we need to do, um, and I'm just like sort of making this up as we go because I'm actually not sure what is happening, is we can try different things in our, in our, in our, in our loss function. Um, this is something that's actually not quite easy to implement on the fly. So I probably won't do it right now. But one way is that you can weight the underrepresented class a little bit more in your loss function. Because remember, we, we never said that our loss function had to be uniform over all the points. 
we can emphasize some points more than others. So this is called class rating. This is one particular example of what you could do. Um, another idea is perhaps to make this model more complicated. So instead of having just five, we could have 100 and 100. This might make it, this might allow it to learn more complicated functions. So let's take a look at whether this actually is the case. So we have our API running, it's gonna do some training and it seems like it's plateaued here at 0.5. So clearly there's something strange in this data that it's not easy, that's not so easy to think about and it's confusing the model. And unfortunately, even if we add like even a couple more layers, whoops, a couple more layers, we try it again, it probably will give us the same thing. So at this point, you know, if it's still not going down, you, all, you might also want to consider checking your data. So like, let's make sure that our Ys are, are actually correct, that they're not just all zeros for some reason. And as you can see, there is actually a pretty good distribution of ones and zeros. I'm actually kind of confused as to why it doesn't work so well. Hmm. So let's see. Um, one thing that we can do is we can do y.count. So we can count the number of ones um, or it's like y dot np dot sum y equals one. I think this is the right way to do it. And then we can print length of y or np dot shape y. So it says here that we have 81 that, that, uh, that died out of the 306. So 81 over 306 is about 25%. This is not an awful percentage, but if you notice one minus this value is suspiciously close to, um, to, uh, to, to the outputs that we found, to the uh, accuracy that we found. So it's completely plausible that our model figured out that, hey, we never have to predict one. We don't wanna predict one. So we'll just predict zero all the time and we can get this accuracy. So, um, Full disclosure, I do not know why this is happening and I will need some time to figure out why this is. Um, and I don't think I should waste all of your time doing this. So um, here's the thing. I'm gonna send out some instructions later tonight once I fix everything up and it'll contain a new URL. It won't be this weird temporary ngrok thing. It'll be an actual URL where you can just swap out the URLs and it'll just work just fine. And then in the meantime, you can just build out the interface for this. So you can build out an interface that takes in three values, um, make sure to put labels there so that the person who's using it knows what it is. Like you can put labels there, you have three inputs in there and then you can pass it into the API and then you return a value, you can display it. You can be like, okay, this person has an X percent chance of dying. So um, you can recommend to continue through the surgery or not. And Although the coding on this section is a lot lighter than it was yesterday where you had to build this whole Markov thing, um, this is actually a very useful skill to have. There's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of potential in people building on APIs and using them in more effective manners. And this is good practice with that. So with that said, stay on the lookout for an email once I fix this bug with this machine learning model. And um, yeah, are there any final questions from today? Anything that we talked about? Okay, great. Well, since it is almost five o'clock, you are all free to go. Thanks so much for coming. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out over email or Discord at any time. See y'all.